Okay, so as I said on Tuesday, most probably we're going to get through my PS Prince and Yoder and maybe Troxel today. Um, and the way I want to do um, at least the first couple, Maya, where's my group? So I have um, stages to my right. To my left is a uh, child. In front of me is parents, right? Okay. So because this case involves parent versus state or teacher versus state, but I'm going to look at the parent side to make um, the argument for Maya. The way I want to do this is have um, some volunteers to um, make the argument for the appellant and the puppies before the U.S. Supreme Court. And then I also want um, some volunteers again, <laughs> as I say volunteers, uh, um, to also um, act as justices of the Supreme Court um, asking the um, attorneys whatever questions you, you want to ask them. So let's do it um, this way. I only have four state attorneys sitting today. <laughs> By the way, this is Abiba. She's an online student um, that's going to be joining us until it gets close to her, did I say it, due date. Um, so she'll be in the day class for a little bit um, as well. Where, where am I? Uh, attorneys with the child. Where's Leslie? Where's, who else? Sandra, you're attorney for the child, right? And so is... Uh, Amy, are you? No, you're with the family. Okay. It, we don't really need you guys so much yet. The attorneys for the child, because you have no voice in these proceedings. Uh, so why don't we do it this way? Um, Sandy and Elaine um, and Abiba can join me and ask questions. Right? As any of the justices of the attorneys for the parent, parent slash teacher and, and the state. Okay, we'll do it that way. All right. So um, assuming that the case of Naya v. Nebraska get called, let's look at um, first of all who would be speaking first, who's the appellant in this case. Geneva, who's the appellant? Um, Myers, right? He was trying to convict him and he appealed. That's right. All right. So, do you want to go first? Sure. I and mean, assume I'm that you, you, you know, you're representing the teacher, Meyer, but you're making the, the argument for the too. family in general. Okay. okay. I would say um, that it has to do with the parents and the parents' right to control um, their children and uh, decide. Wait, can I just stop you oh. and just start? You, you're jumping in. Um, in the middle, oh, okay. instead of starting at Would you like a brief recitation of facts? <laughs> 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 I know. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, the appellant. Okay, so um, Myers was an instructor in a parochial school. Uh, he was charged with unlawfully teaching the subject of reading in the German language, which is considered a more modern language, um, to a 10-year-old child. Um, and the current law in the state was that you can't teach a child who is not successfully past the eighth grade a foreign language. They have to teach them English first. Um, so I would then argue that. So counsel, yeah. just so what is what is the issue before the court? So the issue is whether the state statute um, infringes the liberty guaranteed to Meyer and, and parents uh, by the Fourteenth Amendment. So the liberty to. Could, could you explain that a little bit more? Yes, um, under the 14th Amendment, no state shall deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, and in this case, the state is depriving the teacher of his ability to um, teach a modern language for his profession, and then um, also the parents' liberty of the right to control their parent, uh, their children, and um, so let me stop you there. Uh, if you could describe a little bit more where this uh, liberty right comes from, because it's not in the Constitution. Right. It's not. So, it's not listed but, under the Fourteenth Amendment, but from prior case law, prior constitutional law cases, um, there 
the court has recognized that parents have a right to uh, control their children and a right to raise their children in a way that they see fit. And then also that uh, um, there is a privilege and immunity, a liberty that a person has a right to have their own occupation and the right to employment in whatever they choose. Okay. Um, Amy, you're uh, also parents' counsel. A different question. Uh, doesn't the state have an interest in promoting the civic development by inhibiting the education of young, you know, in the foreign language before they could learn American ideals, so to speak? Right, and it all stems from uh, the foreigners that were coming into the states. They were trying to make sure, they, they said it would be the public's interest because it would be the demise of the country. If they so, so what is the family argument against that premise? That you can't interfere with the parent's liberty by pretending the state's protecting a public interest by because you're depriving the child to acquire knowledge and you're denying the parent's right to control the education of their children, which is a fundamental right. So it's a, tends a, it's a violation of a fundamental right given to parents and it exceeds the limits of the power of the state. There's no proof of harm. I have sort of a long quote to read to, to, to you, but I want you to listen to it, and um, I, I, again, that, that, that's a good answer, but I'm just not sure that it would totally sway the court. Um, and, and you mentioned it before about the legislature, so this is what the Nebraska Supreme Court had to say. The legislature had seen the baneful effects of permitting foreigners who had taken residence in this country to rear and educate their children in the language of their native land. Their native land. The result of that was found to be inimical to our own safety, to allow the children of foreigners who had emigrated here to be taught from early childhood the language of the country of their parents, was to rear them with that language as their mother tongue. It was to educate them so that they must always think in that language, think in that language, and as a consequence, naturally inculcate in them the ideas and sentiments foreign, foreign to the best interest of this country. The statute, therefore, was intended not only to require that the education of all children be conducted in the English language, but that until they had grown into that language, until it had become a part of them, they should not in the schools be taught any other language. The obvious purpose of this statute was that the English language should be and become the mother tongue of all children reared in this state. The enactment of such a statute comes reasonably within the police power of the state. So what? A, how, do, how do parents counsel um, counter that particular argument? Ed? Um, <coughs> <laughs> yeah. And feel free, my justices, whoever I told was justice. By the way, everybody from um, from Sandy all down on down, you're all justices for now because you represent the children and you really don't have a, um, a an interest as a party in these proceedings. So you're all justices, just like I am, and you can ask questions. Go ahead. I would argue that what the government is trying to control is the ideals of the child. And I'm the sorry, parent, say that again. The what? ideals of the parent and the child. That by learning a foreign language, the child is going to be less of an American and not follow the American ideals. And I think those ideals are established by a parent, not by just learning a foreign language at school. Okay. Anybody else on the parents? So I, let me ask another question. And actually, in asking that, um, I'm, I'm going to switch and also ask the state to. to um, uh, think about the answer to this question. So we're looking at um, at this statute and, and, and trying to decide if this statute somehow violates the Constitution, right? Um, so what, and I've heard from the parents and the teachers' side that there's some liberty rights involved here. And I'm not quite sure about the nature of those rights, number one, because um, this is an early case. You know, you mentioned before that the court, had, well, not yet, because this right. was like the first one. Um, <laughs> so um, not only do I want to hear more about the nature of those rights, but I also want to hear um, from, from the state um, 
the, the test that should be applied in determining the legality of the statute and in, in, in considering what the test should be, we need to look at the nature of the parental right, right? You're all following me. So I'm gonna have Joe answer that as well, counsel of the state. I think that the standard that we want to use is whether or not the act is reasonable, whether or not it's, um, whether it is not capricious or arbitrary. And why is, would that be a standard? Well, if there's a reason to justify the, the use of the police power, then it seems to make, it seems to, that the government should have the authority to, um, to act as in its role as parents patriae to um, come up with things that are for the best interest of society. And as long as they have a reasonable, rational basis for it. Why does it have to be just a reasonable, rational basis? I mean, I've heard from, again, from the, the, the parents that, that the um, parental right here sounds to be really, really important. And you're telling me the state only has to show a reasonable basis. That's kind of a low threshold. So why is that? showing um, a fundamental right, the state would have to What do you mean by fundamental right, Council? Um, that it basically it goes to the core of um, what the Constitution stands for, that it's giving liberty that we've always had, that, it's al the, that everyone acknowledges a parent's right to raise their child, and that it's so rooted in our culture that the parent controls their own child. And, until Does Council for State agree that it's a fundamental right? That we're talking about fundamental rights. Kate, Kate? Education is not a fundamental right. But the, we're not uh, well, you said no, but give me another reason why. Um. <laughs> Based on what the nature of the parental right is here. No? I would say that Parents have a, uh, a right to determine the education and moral fiber of their, and the education of their child, but the society, represent the, the state now, the society wants to ensure that it's not at the detriment of society as a whole, and I think to jump ahead nine years to say, Lawrence, for instance, where there's a microcosm of people speaking only Spanish, by teaching their own children Spanish, they are preventing their children from attaining the same goals as the rest of the country because they're limiting them to themselves. And this is the mentality they had at this era is they were trying but to you're open up their now. minds. You're arguing it now. Yes. The and this it, is what the state was trying to do to prevent that. The, the, ter the bad portion of this is that the parents would be in a, unable to assist their children or communicate with them as well if the children begin to learn Why English so and they're important. speaking German or Russian or whatever. Why is it so important for the state to intervene in a situation like this? To prevent the, the uh, negative impact it may have on the children themselves, on long term to have a family and establish a business and survive in our society as we have it established. It's very competitive. But why should the state intervene in family matters? Is this not a family issue? Well, the, the, taking it from the point of view of the state, they're saying it's a state issue. They're not bringing in the issue of the children and what's best for the children. They're saying what's best for the country. And it's best for the country to for all children to be raised in a common language so that they can have common ideals and grow into our culture. Karen? We're talking about a public policy issue. And because of public it, What is the public the, policy issue? That children have to, that English is our dominant, if English is the language of this country, and that we want these children to be conversant in English so that they can be successful and can assimilate and be part of the country. So the state is not trying to replace the parent, that's okay. not what the state is trying to do, which is why I think you were, you were getting to 
the, the you know, a compelling state interest in looking at it with strict scrutiny because it is a fundamental right to have children and for the state not to intervene as long as the children are being cared for without neglect, you know, in, in a, you know, they don't have to intervene at that point. But that's not what the state is trying to do. It is a broad, and in some ways that's why the statute fails because it is so broad, that's what the court says. But yet, it, it is, that's why it should, we believe it should succeed. Okay. Uh, Council for Cameron, there's so some I was say, just uh, going to also, you and then Amy next. I was just going to also say that um, the state has an issue when they're applying this because uh, the Constitution is supposed to extend to all of the all children and so some children are born with another language and now they're trying to force them to learn english first however what about children who are born with knowing english and their parents want to further educate them in another language then that means they're not allowed to learn another language and become even more intelligent but they're not saying hold on a second because amy for the, the parents to have also okay. the, it is a fundamental right that is they're allowed to acquire useful knowledge. They're allowed to marry. They're allowed to establish, uh, you know, what religions they have by telling them. Uh, okay, so you just American said two thing. different things, Council. If there's, there's one thing to be allowed to marry, uh, to raise your children the way you please, um, and but it's different to acquire and a, di a, a, a different and more fundamental right is the right to practice your religion. So that's why I was looking at, and I still really haven't got an answer at what test should be applied to this statute based on the nature of the parental rights. Go ahead. They're, they're targeting a, a minority of the people, and they're putting such a broad net, it's, it's hitting everybody, where the American people have all, public policy basically says education's important, the acquisition, the acquisition of, the <laughs> acquisition? <laughs> acquisition of knowledge is important. Um, you know, it's a supreme important and needs to be promoted. And the, you know, the ordinance says, you know, it includes religion and it, it includes everything. And it's good for the government and it's good for the happiness of mankind. So restricting that, you're basically killing or taking away the people's right to pursue happiness in their own way. Because you're, you're restricting them in another way. And there's no proof that the German language is of any harm to the country. Okay, now Leslie had her hand up, and I'm, your, your role is a justice, so are you going to ask a question? Yes. Okay, well, go ahead. I can ask a question. You right? can. Go ahead. I want to ask oh, a question. You're asking parent or state? Parent. Okay. Um, what, do you, what do you feel is in the child's best interest? Because that should be the focus there. In the child's best interest? You're asking the state? Marcus, the state. Okay, go yeah, ahead. You can go first. The child's best interest is first. He's living in this country. The state is trying to further the Americanization of Americans, rather than having a hodgepodge of nationalities that cannot communicate. So I'd like to know the same thing from the oh, I think the state's arguing is that this child's being taught just German. But if the facts tell us that this child's being taught German after his regular classes, so he isn't learning English, he's learning German as a second language, um, which obviously is going to help him later on, um, intellectually, educationally, um, so we're not talking about uh, a child who is being taught school in German language, in English as a second language. So I, I think that sort of defeats the argument of the, the The state has some good arguments here, you know, relative to that uh, uh, you know, children are uh, citizens as well, and they're looking at the the best interest of those citizens and you want them to become, you know, law-abiding, good American citizens, et cetera. But um, I'm also wondering about the slippery slope here in this. It also a great quote in, and I don't, I don't remember if it's in Nebraska, Nebraska Supreme Court's language, but um, of course it, it has to do with um, practices in ancient Greece, <laughs> um, and I just have to read it. It does, deals with Sparta, and this is what uh, you know. I'm afraid of. In order to submerge the individual and develop ideal citizens, that's what you're saying, Sparta assembled the males at seven into barracks and entrusted their subsequent education and training to official guardians. Although such me measures have been deliberately approved by men of great genius, their ideas touching the relation between individual and state were wholly different from those upon which our institutions rest. 
and will hardly be affirmed by any legislature could impose such restrictions upon the people of a state without doing violence to both letter and spirit of the Constitution. So how can we be assured that something like that wouldn't happen if, the, if, if this court finds this statute to be constitutional? Karen? Because this statute has a limitation. It's eight, it stops at the eighth grade or the age of 12. They're not prohibiting these students from learning German after that, but they want, you know, but, it, so, but it's up to that point that they can't be taught to secondary learning. And again, I think in we school. have to, in school, in school. And, in I school. Think, and, and I also think we have to look at the perspective of what the times were like at, at that time. This was the time in our country where there was a huge influx of immigrants and people who could not speak English. And you know, they were trying to unite. I look at it as as if they were trying to pull a country together and a people together with the commonality of the same language. This was probably there were probably many parents who just couldn't speak English. You know wanted their children to be proficient in German as well and not lose. And we were also at a time where we were where we were at war with Germany. You know, but isn't that you know what you say is 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 true in some respects, but it's also true today that that, that you know the US, the US will always be or it still is a melting pot. But I you know I, I'm a child of um, right. um, parents that emigrated. My first language was Greek. I went to a school where um, I didn't speak English for a while. <laughs> so, um, I don't know why I'm bringing this up, but uh, <laughs> let's deliberate. Uh, oh, okay, yeah, how about just some closing, any um, parents council, I'll give you um, a moment if you want to summarize anything or to make any other arguments that you haven't made yet. Yes? Well, just that, um, like, the parents, like we've said many times, like they have a natural duty to give their child the education that's suitable to their life. Um, and that just by learning the German language wasn't harming the public in any way, just the mere knowledge of what the language was wasn't going to bring an emergency for the state or like bring violence or something like that. There were no emergencies to have given a rise to such a prohibition of learning any language that was foreign. Thank you. Any back to the state? Well, the Constitution does allow for the state to um, to have a police authority and use a police authority. Um, that that is part of the Constitution. And here, as my sister mentioned, it is not unbridled police authority. There are limitations on it um, in regards to the age and. It is important to have um, a community with a common language for the children um, to be able to grow up and function as um, you know, people in a democratic society. Okay. Now, we've heard the arguments of, of counsel on both sides, but I, I want to get back to the question that I didn't really quite get, um, I think, enough on relative to the statute and how we look at the constitutionality of the statute um, based on the nature of the parental rights. I mean, I heard something from the state saying something like that it should be reasonable basis, rational, 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 rational basis. So what's the reason for rational basis as opposed to something, you know, much more, uh, uh, much harder for the state um, to overcome? Why? I hear that it's a, um, a due process issue. I hear that it's parents' liberty rights. Liberty rights um, that are not the same, for example, as a, um, a, a defendant who faces, you know, uh, as a result of a possible conviction, faces a loss of liberty. So it's different, right? Karen? Well, we would argue as the state that this isn't a fundamental right, although it's certainly an important right to the parents to control the Wait, We're the justices now, so you can tell me what, okay. how you think we should look at the statute. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. We're all deliberating. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
although it's important for the parents to be able mm. to control mm. the decision making for their children, it's not a fundamental right, and the parents are not a suspect class, and so no higher level of scrutiny is required other than rational basis. Okay, and so the state has to show only that there's some um, relationship, right, between the statute and the state's goal, right? Because it, 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 it's not, a, it's a quite an important right, obviously, for parents. And um, I think Amy was alluding to the, that list, right, to marry, to contract, to such and such, and all of these kinds of rights. But, um, you know, balance against um, a, a loss of liberty or, or a, a right to practice your religion, they're lower on the scale, so to speak, right? Ma? I think one thing we've overlooked is that we're not imposing uh, the statute upon the parents at all, where they're imposing it upon the school systems not to teach, and that's the different thing. That's yeah, the and, not, and that's very important, because notice that 1923, so this is the first time the Supreme Court um, has kind of spoken about family rights, but it's in the nature of a criminal case prosecuting a teacher. Um, so even though I had you do parental arguments just for purpose of, of our discussion, um, that wasn't, you know, what was precisely before the court. Uh, very, very astute, yeah, absolutely. Amy, and then Abhi, well, Abhi, and then the statute Abhi. itself is interfering with the teacher's right to, to teach. Right, the exactly, language. exactly. Abhi, that's, that's and that was the basis of the appellant's so, right. argument. And you know, why the they're court not protecting the child anywhere. I mean, you're not protecting the child's health. In fact, you're actually going to impair the child's learning because languages do come easier at a younger age. So you're actually by limiting the teacher, you are, it has a, even though it's not a direct, it's, it's like it's facially neutral to the parents and the children, but it's right. got a discriminatory effect in the end. Have you, have you had your yeah, but uh, isn't the statute interfering on the parents' right to educate their children? Well, and that's but what, case, that's what the, this case now stands for, even though that, you know, really wasn't what was before the Supreme Court. It has become, you know, as I said, old old case, 1920s, still is cited today by parental rights advocates. Yes, yeah, so my um, question to the state is, isn't that a fundamental right for parents to raise uh, their children that the state cannot interfere? So how come it's only rational basis that uh, they're not a suspect class, but it's a fundamental right? So my question is, why only rational basis? Why not strict school? Go ahead. The state does interfere with rights to educate children all the time. We require that they go to school. We require that they can only do certain things at certain times, whether or not they can work. There are limitations that within our police power, we are allowed to say, if it's in the best interest of society and the children, that we can impose those limitations. Yeah, it might be with, yeah, in, only your police power, but the thing is, how is it impacting the kids? How is it impacting the welfare of the kids? to teach them a German language. They are speaking English anyways because they're going to go to school and speak English. So to teach them another language, how is it going to impact their welfare? Or how is it going to impact their intellectual Who's, who's welfare? The kids' welfare. Well, the argument is that it's, it's keeping them from being full members of American society by learning English. I mean, that's the argument that we're making. But that they're young children, and they're not, you know, it was easier for them to become proficient in one language prior to becoming proficient in the second. They're not saying they can never learn German, but they're saying that they need to be proficient first in English, and that usually is achieved by the age of 12 or the eighth grade, and then they can be taught German. Okay, so let's but summarize. Why is this case important? Give me all the reasons why. Yes. Because you have the state trying to enforce their police power and regulate uh, something dealing with the school system, but then you also have And primarily it's the best interest of the child and stays determining what they think the best interest of the child is, whereas the parents are seeing it differently. Be careful when you use the term fundamental right unless you see it in the case. Um, again, some rights are, 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 are higher, so to speak, than others. And we'll get to that when you hear the, the, the Prince v. Mass case. Um, but rights that are important, uh, rights that um, stem from the Supreme Court interpreting the 14th Amendment, life, liberty, property, that in, in, interpreting that um, parents um, have this 
uh, what I put on the board, this right to um, protection from state intervention into their relationship. A right that's not per se in the Constitution, right? But that the court has held to be important because of the nature of the family relationship. And thus, it, because it's important but not quite fundamental, for lack of a better word, um, the, the state sometimes has an easier time to intrude into relationships like that. And that's why you have a, a, a lesser sort of test that the state only has. But in spite of the fact that the state only had to prove some relationship, the state lost in this case, again, because the Supreme Court um, uh, opined that both the teacher's right to teach and parents' right to bring up their children um, over a balance was far superior to the, the, the state's right to have the child you know, not instructed in the German language. So famous uh, uh, parental rights case, obviously I'd be putting it on, on the board, and I will, I guess, under um, parents, win for the parents, so to speak. So that's the Meyer case. So um, Pierce was decided almost in conjunction, when was it? A couple of years later. Um, Let's do the same thing, and I want to try to, I want to be able to get to print, so let's keep this one maybe 15 minutes or so, all right? So Pierce versus Society of Sisters. So let me hear from the state first, as the appellants here. schools involved, both private schools, one was a Catholic convent or whatever you call it, and they were mixing religious training in with the secular training. The other school was a military school, uh, which was for boys only, and it was teaching uh, military correctness along with secular training. And the state had a statute um, making it a misdemeanor to not send your child to, to a public school. Uh, which in effect would have affected both private schools um, economically. They would have just gone under for that reason. Uh, this case then... So what's uh, your argument for the state? What, what I'm sorry, uh, what's, what statute are we talking about? Uh, this is the statute making it a misdemeanor to not send your child to a public school. Yeah, compulsory education. Compulsory okay. education. So. What's the state's policy? What's the state's goal? What's the state's I, purpose? The state's purpose and policy is to uh, control the education that all the children are getting and to do so by mandating they all go to public school so everyone throughout the state has the same education. Uh, not mixing in the religious aspect, that's the separation of church and state. Uh, the military is a different thing. Uh, but basically trying to control the education of everybody is is getting uniformly. Okay, so <laughs> 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 no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so Pierce come, obviously this case is coming after Meyer, and this is the same court that has decided Meyer. So one of the questions that obviously comes from the state would get is don't we have to follow Meyer? How would you distinguish Meyer if you represent the state? I'll let you think about that because that's a really difficult question. <laughs> How about the, the parent and the school? So you know, what interest are we talking about? What is the school's interest? What are the parental rights? The right to choose. Because now you're talking about compulsory education, right. which there's a very good policy and a very good argument for you know all for the state to be able to regulate all schools. So 
So what would your argument for the family be against that, Amy? It's the right, the parents are losing their rights to choose schools for both their mental and religious training. So I mean, that, that, and, and it's also the child's loss of influencing where they go to school. Mm -hmm. Has the state thought about my question? Yeah, come on. coming from the state side, uh, and having a little experience myself, I, my younger years I went to a three-room schoolhouse. We had three teachers teaching the eighth grades. Mm -hmm. And this public school system was inferior in Vermont where I lived, so we all went to Catholic school. So in this case, I would argue for this, the state is trying to encourage all children to go to public schools so they can get the financing and to eliminate the private schools, which is competing with the public school That's system. True. But I, I still don't, I, I haven't heard from the state relative to what this court would do with with, with the decision that from it made Meyer. a couple of years ago in Meyer. Karen? I, I think that here we are talking about the child's whole education. In Meyer, right. we were just talking okay. about one subject. Here is the entire education of the child, and the state wants to ensure that um, they're being taught the important and necessary subjects and by um, teachers, qualified teachers. And so the way in which the state can supervise and monitor the subjects and the staff, the teachers, is to have it through the public school. It's much more difficult to regulate and supervise and ensure that the children are getting what they need mm -hmm. if uh, they're in private schools. So, uh, family? Uh, with this mandatory or compulsory education act, you are now taking away the basically the whole right of the parent to send their children where they feel it is. Okay, but you're not, uh, uh, you wouldn't counsel be arguing um, um, but, but this court to do away with compulsory education. So how is it that, um, that y your clients are somehow or should be exempted from the compulsory education statute. Because with the religious school and with the military academy, like in addition to the education that they're getting, they're getting military training or they're getting religious training, which has an influence on their life and the way that the parent wants to raise their child for those additional obligations within their life that relate to the military training. And so you're training. saying that the choice of schools should rest should with the parent? parent. They can't prove the state can't prove that these schools are giving them inferior education unless you can prove that they're harming the child okay. or providing a lesser. You know what is the overall objective? Just to go to public school or to get a good education? You know I, I think that's the discrepancy. Is if you're getting a better education, equal or better, what justification do they have to send you to public school? Any last arguments from the state side? Well, I, in terms of, I, I think the state has a terrible argument. <laughs> 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 of course. <laughs> it's, almost, it's, it's really, you know, I think it was, what my sister pointed out was really the only valid argument that we would have is the quality of the education, you know, to continue to, without having the tools, you know, to have the quality. And what they should do is just create another statute that allows them to have standards so yeah. that this, yeah. they will, you know, have the same quality of Otherwise, I get that. This law came before the ruling. I mean, the law was created before we had the ruling in the previous case. Right, so right, that's we, true. It, it, uh, makes yeah. it, it makes a problem that it was 1922 right. when they actually made the ruling. Right, and private schools were new, you know? That was just coming about, you know? Um, a great qu quote, though, that just stands for the case so succinctly. The child is not the mere creature of the state. You know, so the state has, certainly has, um, an interest in children, an interest in, in child welfare, an interest in regulating schools, but um, the, the parents have the choices to which school. So Pierce again follows directly from, from the Maya ruling, and again, the right of parents to be free from state intervention. And again, even though it's a, a, um, a case involving the school, systems as the parties and not the parents. It's cited today at the 
again, for, um, on the basis of parental rights, both Niner and Pierce, um, and just see them cited um, frequently together, standing for that same sort of general rule. Hey, leave the family alone. The state shouldn't interfere in these in these matters where the parents have a substantive, you know, due process right to raise their children the way that they that they feel is is right. Um, now here with Prince, and this is why I was hopping on um, earlier in Meyer. How do we look at this case in terms of the, the basis of the parental rights? Prince is quite different in many ways. Um, but let's start it off as start off as the argument. So the argument for Sarah Prince from the parental rights advocates and then the arguments for the state. Um, and I totally forgot who was the appellant. I think it was Sarah Prince. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. All right. So who wants to start, Amy? Uh, Sarah Prince was my client was convinc uh, convicted of furnishing a child with magazines uh, that where she would solicit or uh, sell these magazines contrary to the laws in effect where children were not allowed to work uh, on labor laws and whatnot. But Sarah Prince is your client. Correct. Okay. What else can you tell us about Sarah Prince? Uh, Sarah Prince is a Jehovah's Witness, okay. uh, raising her child with the beliefs of uh, promoting their uh, religion and solic you know, soliciting other members to come into their organization. Um, she, uh, her, she had a nine-year-old daughter who she normally would have them leave, stay at home at night. She brought them, uh, the children really wanted to come and were upset, why can't I go? So she had them distributing materials. Neither Sarah nor her daughter sold any materials or handed out any materials that evening. They just happened to be mm -hmm. on the street when they were approached by the officer. Okay. Um, nice dissertation of the case. Now let me hear some arguments. Argument for the, the parents? Yeah. Um, the parents have a right to bring up their children the way that they want to, um, especially in regards to religion, religious belief. So, okay, so what do you mean by that? So Sarah Prince, how, how would you differentiate um, Sarah Prince's um, um, rights and interests mm -hmm. from the, 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 the previous cases that have come before this court, Meyer and Pierce? Um, in the Prince case, Sarah has the right to bring up her child in the way that she should be able to, um, compared to as, 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 we as she decided in case, Myron yes, here, yeah. how to um, educate your child. Okay, um, that can be compared, and also the child has a right to practice his or her religion. Well, the child is not a party. The child's not a party. For the parents, but so. there are two liberties at, at stake. The, the the mode of the parent to raise her child and to the religious and freedoms. to practice her religion. Yes. Okay. All right. So you've established that. Mm -hmm. What's your argument? Uh, I would argue that the um, there are liberty issues. There the, the right to practice religion and to bring up your child is important. And the children willingly wanted to go out with her mother and hand out pamphlets promoting the religion that they believe in. And the parent did How not- How does this not violate the child labor laws? Well, there is an argument for the child labor laws. However, um, the parent rights are more important. The children were not forced to hand out pamphlets. Uh, I don't. I don't believe that they had had sold. I don't think that they the um, the children sold. Wasn't there a, an argument that they didn't collect money okay. or funds okay. from that evening? All right. Let me get from the state now. I'm hearing from um, the attorneys for Sarah Prince that her right is actually far superior than any the. the uh, parental right that this court has encountered before, because Sarah Prince 
is not only bringing up this child, but um, is asserting that it's part of their religion to distribute these pamphlets. So isn't it more difficult now for the state to uh, um, advance their argument in terms of Sarah Prince possibly violating you know, child labor? Joe? Um, well, it would seem that it would be a more difficult case to present. In reality, what they're doing here is saying that the state has the right, even the duty, to balance the rights of the parents with society's interest in the best welfare of the child. And that when we have this, that they use language like children cannot become the martyr, um, can't be used to, parents can't make martyrs of their children, that there is a, an interest that we simply have to say the state needs to intervene when a nine-year-old girl is out late at night um, doing work in a public place, that the state needs to intervene and say, you've crossed the line where, where this is, this is a form of negative action towards a child and abuse. Does the state um, does the state have to show uh, uh, something more uh, than it had to in previous cases? Do you know what you know? I'm, what I'm getting at here, right? Sarah Prince. Her name was Sarah, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is a Jehovah Witness. So it isn't just, oh, I, you know, I want my kid to go to this school. I want my kid to learn German. It's, I want my kid to, um, I, you know, to, 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 I, I want my kid to do what I want my kid to do. <laughs> Plus, we're both Jehovah Witnesses. And we're talking about the First Amendment now, not just the 14th Amendment. So isn't it much harder for the state to prove its case here? to acknowledge the constitutionality of these laws than it was in Meyer and in Pierce. Mm -hmm. So everybody agrees with me. Why? Because I think now it's becoming criminal. She's like they were criminal. Uh, the prior to, we, they were all criminal cases. But Meyer, I mean, the Pierce, parent. Prince. But the parent wasn't criminal before, now the parent is. Now the parent is, the parent, that, that's another difference in the case. You know, we now have the parent being a party and being before the court and advancing directly her own rights, her own interests. Over the um, and again, because of the, <coughs> pretend, suppose that she wasn't Jehovah and she was, I don't know, um, distributing, um, what's a Mary Kay? <laughs> Avon, Avon, I don't know, yeah. all right? And she was being prosecuted for taking her child around on a Sunday night. She would only be able to assert, right, 14th Amendment. There's no mm -hmm. religious thing going on here. Yeah. If that was the case, Joe, then the state would only have to do what? Prove that, prove that she was violating the law. It, it, was, what's the test? You said it before. Rational basis, rational basis right. for the statute for prosecuting her. But because she's also Jehovah Witness and that's First Amendment, the state has to show what? Sure. What's the magic sure. word here? Sure. Sure. <laughs> One person. One person. Katie? Compelling. Compelling interest for the statute. Much more difficult. Yet the state won. Right? Mm -hmm. So, first two cases much easier for the state to prove. Substantive due process, 14th Amendment. Um, again, those two cases are cited for leave the family alone. We have the right to bring the children up the way we please. But now with Prince, state intervention is justified. And state intervention is justified, why? What's the compelling interest? The welfare of the child. But if the state succeeds because they avoid the religious question. They, at the end of their opinion, they say that this case is relevant. They are holding it only relevant to the facts of this case. But we're not making a determination which should be used. You know, it, you know they sort of avoid making a, a the, the language is basically. Uh, well, where it was. I think Joe was somebody I, said it before. Yeah. Parents may be free to become martyrs themselves? Is that what you're getting at? I have a good one that they, they quote. They Go said, ahead. 
no denial of <coughs> equal protection in excluding their children from doing there what no other children may do, uh, which was selling things, which was doing things on the streets at night. So they're saying, we're not distinguishing between Jehovah's Witnesses and all kids. This is wrong to do to any kid, no matter what the religious background is. Children so we're talking about the welfare way. of the children. Yeah. We're talking about possible harm. Um, I took it as the safety because the streets were not you were not safety, meant to be terms for like that. To distribute. They say our ruling does not extend beyond the facts the case presents. They always say that. <laughs> <laughs> Now this case becomes the basis for obviously a lot of the state intervention cases that we'll be studying later on in abuse and neglect. Um, Katie, I don't know who had the hand up first. I, I just, reading this, I thought it, the court kind of viewed it as though they were trying to use the First Amendment as a shield. They weren't going to regulate, you know, the It's interesting the because one itself, thing, um, oh yeah, oh good, we're gonna have time for Yoder. I wanna do Yoder. Um, and it, 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 as an introduction to Yoder, let me say this, and I don't know, go back and read the language of the two cases and compare the way the court talks about the Jehovah Witnesses mm -hmm. in Prince yeah. Yeah. and the way the court talks about the Amish yeah. Yeah. in Yoder. Mm -hmm. So, the, you know, uh, again, it's sort of a hidden rationale. Um, coupled with, and again, I told you before, I'm not a real history buff, but the child lay, it was around at the same time that the unions started in the U.S., um, and that may have also had something to do with a ruling in terms of, you know, you don't want kids out there because adults should be in the jobs and so forth. Um, <laughs> but let's, let's talk about Yoder. Does anyone in here know anything about the Amish other than reading the case? <laughs> I love it when somebody knows they and they can a, tell us they more. Have a, like a, well, there's something like name you know, is it a plantation area? Some still some people that absolutely number one. They're separate in terms of communities, right? What else do we know, Sandy? How about for meeting the case? Oh. <laughs> Suppose you were going to summarize for the uh, um, <laughs> the parents in Yoda. Oh, everybody has their hands up. Never mind, they're going to bail you out. Who was first? Who wants to go? Um, I'm just going to say that their religion focuses on trade skills and learning a certain trade within their community. They don't rely on um, power, and they mm -hmm. rely on each other as a tight knit community to take care of things using their specially trained skills and, and they want to instill that in their children right. uh, in order to have the community grow and function. Okay, what else? I was just going to say they're more self-sustaining, like the, their community, they try to do everything themselves and not um, intertwine with modern industry type things. Okay, uh, anything else? So how would you people that represent the parents um, be making an argument uh, against the state in, the, in this case. So we're still talking about the compulsory education law um, as we did in the Pierce case, but again, you have uh, uh, families that wanted to somehow be exempted from at least a, a portion of that, right? Subjecting their children to other ways of life that go against their religious beliefs. I mean, they they don't deny getting further education, but their whole goal is to bring their children back to the land and, and, and kind of come back. So putting them into the public schools <coughs> expose them to dangers and other things that they don't want their children to be exposed to. Okay. Yeah. So um, yeah, kind of along the same and the same line is that they emphasize informal learning through doing. So after they go through the primary education up through the eighth grade, where they believe that sending their children to high school takes them away from their community and brings them away from their way of life, which is deeply rooted in their religion. 
religious beliefs that you need to be closer to the earth, you need to be like working the ground and soil and stuff, that takes them away from that with the modern ideals and intellectual learning that happens through the eighth, through high school and um, higher education. And they don't believe in doing that and it's so deeply rooted in our religion that it's not something that we can do and if we're prosecuted for that, then we're on a conflict between being prosecuted by the state or risking uh, like sinning against God. So he, 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 here's a question for the uh, parental rights advocates. H how would you distinguish Prince from your case? Go ahead. Um, well, like I was going to say this earlier, that in Prince there was a quote in there that said that Sarah Prince's contention was that the streets where they were distributing the materials for their religion was the church, but really it wasn't like her saying, or the state saying that she couldn't distribute the materials with her child because that was a violation of the employment law, wasn't really inhibiting her ability to raise her children in their religion and for her to practice her religion, whereas the, child of, the children of the Amish community, like having them have to go to secondary school inhibits their religion because what they do after they pull the kids out is like strictly guided by their religious beliefs. Geneva, and then we'll hear from the state. I was just gonna say along those lines that in Prince, she was more concerned with having her children practice religion and in this case, it has to do more so with education and the religion having an effect on the education of the child. So in this case, the Amish community feels, because of their religion, that them teaching their child is better education than sending them to a school. So uh, let me ask the state, so what, what harm would it be to um, uh, you know, allow the Amish parents to take their kids out from the eighth grade on? Yeah. Well, we're, we're neglecting to find it, to talk about the rights of the children who have their own constitutional rights. And although in the case they did interview a couple of the children at the end and asked them, is this what you want? And they said, yes, it is what we want. They, they're been indoctrinated that this is the way their life, you know, what their life is, what they have to learn. And we're not giving them the opportunity to fully participate in, in the country that they may want to participate. By limiting their education to an eighth grade education, and that's the strongest argument that the state has. Mm -hmm. it can t that the children have the right to have. But the state did not raise that argument. The, the end. Isn't that why they? Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because that was going to be my closing, and and that's when we sort of begin the what voice for the child when uh, Douglas says. Uh, I think that children should be entitled to be heard. And my question was going to be, um, it was Vernon Yatsi and Barbara Miller. I love these names. Um, I don't know, I just something about them. Uh, you know, suppose that they, they suppose they said the, the opposite, that they wanted to go to high school. Um, you know, what argument would you make for them when the, the parents obviously want to pull them out because the parents want them to stay in the Amish community and whatnot, yeah. Well, and the case specifically talked about how this could be a very different outcome if there was any evidence that the kids uh, wanted to go and the parents were mm -hmm. not allowing it. They did actually talk about that, so I think it would have been very different. Right, right. So it would be yeah. interesting, mm -hmm. too, if the case like this was brought today, let's say someone from the Muslim community and brought, you know, and said, well, we don't want our children, in the we're taking them out in eighth grade. So I wonder if the case, you know, would be an interesting very interesting. See how it would, how would it come out today? Yeah. And it's, it's also part of the the Amish religion, though. Is they they keep them the ingrained in their culture. They keep them separate, but then they also have Rome Springer, where they allow their child once they've got all the basic morals and information in there, they go to the real world and they're allowed to stay out for I forget what it is, thirty or ninety days or whatever it is. They get out for a month and get to live in the real world and see it. And then they make the choice. Is this as youngsters or later on? Like 18, 18? 18. So th then they make the choice. Do I come back into the Amish or do I stay out? And if they choose to stay out, they're th then excommunicated and they're not allowed back in. Oh, interesting. So they yeah. do give them that option. But it's supposed to be a very 
daunting option when you oh it is yeah. but you know but that's the whole right. point of their their culture and that's why it's so important to them to keep to, them to raise them to until them they're here. adults and, and then, then to say, give them now you now you're informed and you've got all the information and in our beliefs now you make that call now you're an adult um, last thought, Leslie. Um, well, I just want to know why we should, as the court, distinguish Amish from any other religion that have their own reasons. The Catholics could say they don't want their kids in high school because they'll learn how to do drugs and they're going to be exposed to all kinds of horrible things. Right. That their right. religion doesn't believe in it, and the Jewish and the Muslim and the Buddhists and everybody. Yeah. Why should we distinguish just the Amish? I That's right. an exception. I don't think we are. I think the, the Compulsory Education Act is. Written, it's a law. Everybody has to go to school at 16. Well, yes. But when you're yeah. homeschool. Uh, yes, and that, uh, yeah, that's a whole other but issue, right? The homeschool. Religion. It just the, has um, a parent thinking. I think they did a TV series once. In See if I can dig it up. But um, even with homeschooling, there's lots of uh, rules and regulations that you have to, um, you know, go through to be approved and, and, and whatnot. So here we have Yoder, and then I'm going to put Yoder descent. So, um, so Yoder is is number one a parental a parental rights case, but I would be putting the Yoder descent right here with the child, and beginning with that is the introduction to Gaul. But up until now, we're talking about um, substantive due process rights of the family. Okay. But with Galt, we begin, I'm not going to erase this right now, but with Galt next week, we're talking about procedural due process, and we're talking about directly the liberty rights of the child. So what I wanted to do um, on Tuesday is the um, mock assignment that I actually have on the schedule for Thursday. We are not going to have class on Thursday. Um, yay! <laughs> um, we're not going to have class on Thursday. I'll be here in the morning, but I won't be here for the afternoon. And I figured rather than try to do a quick class with you guys that we could combine um, what I wanted to do on Thursday with uh, our discussion of golf anyway. Because I think by doing the mock assignment in class, you're going to get a much clearer uh, um, view of the implications of golf. I may not have enough copies, but I'll, I'll make more downstairs because I, we, um, I ended up with more students than I thought today for some reason. I don't know why. I thought there were only 14 of you, so I made 14 copies. Um, how many do we have? How many am I short? Three. three. I'm short three. You know what, Leslie, um, Ahmed, can you yeah, pass one down? And I'm going to give um, actually, you know what? Cameron, can you and Joel look on for one second together? Because I th all I want you to do is look at the roles right now. But don't write on these, write on your notes. You guys can look together. Okay. So next Tuesday, what we will be doing is um, hopefully two and maybe three sort of mock little hearings. So you're going to read the Gall case. First, we're going to assume that um, we're doing the first hearing of Jerry Gall, but it's before the US Supreme Court decision. So notice I have on the handout first hearing before Supreme Court case. And notice I have Judge McGee, so who was the real judge in that case. Um, and so we're going to, I'm going to be looking for roles. I'm going to assign them now. That's why I wanted a little bit of time now at the end of the class. Then we're going to do that hearing first. Then after that, we, we are, I've got second and third hearings. Second hearing is the, the first time Jerry Galt appears before the court being charged with you know, these offenses. But it's after the US Supreme Court case got handed down with all the new rights, all right? And it would be in the nature of an arraignment. Um, so it's Jerry appearing for the first time before the court. And the third hearing is actually these new made up facts that I gave you, um, the direct and cross-examination of Mrs. Cook. So we're going to do a little piece of the trial 
So you can get a flavor for it. The victim, you know, became the witness, and now Jerry has all these rights to face the accused, uh, face the accuser, and whatnot. Um, so I'll be looking for um, somebody to act as the DA, somebody to act as Jerry, etc. In that particular case as well. So let me go around the room and um, see if there's volunteers for these various hearings. Think about not only who you want to be, but uh, where your interests lie and whatnot. So I need somebody to be Jerry Galt in the first hearing. And you know, you could be female and you could still be Jerry Galt, so. <laughs> If I don't have a volunteer, I'm going to pick one. Katie? Yeah. Katie, what's your last name? Faye. Okay, we're gonna, we can all write this down on a sheet of paper. And uh, I'm going to email this to everybody, too, okay? So Kathleen Faye will be Jerry Galt. And then we need somebody to be Mrs. Galt. Are you repeating right Yeah. That, well, let me see. I want to make sure everybody has at least one role to play, and then some of you might have more than one. So, Geneva, you want to be Mrs. Gall? Yeah, I was going to do the second and third year one, but I can, it doesn't matter. Okay, Geneva, Anopolis, mm -hmm. Mrs. Gall. I need somebody to be Jerry's older brother. That's Joe. He's a small part. Joe Keller. Don't worry, I'll probably give you another role. Oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> then I need somebody to be Officer Flag. Aviva. Aviva, A B E B A, right? Battles? Yes, A B A T T A E S. Oh, Al, A T T A E S. Okay. Officer Henderson. Jamie. That's Jamie Krasansky. Krasansky, Officer Henderson. Uh, judge, uh, oh, that's okay. me. Good trick. <laughs> mm -hmm. I get the judge's role. She's, she's <laughs> <a judge. laughs> called this. Judge, oh, clerk. Judge McGee's clerk. The clerk? Clerk. I'll be the clerk. Tanya. Tanya. She just added to class. I'm not oh, you just added the class. Tanya, what's your last name? Dami. Spell? D A L L E M A N Z. Tanya. Dalaman. Judge McGee's clerk. Okay, second hearing. And second and third, we'll take that together. Because it'll go into the examination of, of Mrs. Cook. So, Jerry Galt, now I need a new Jerry Galt, whoever doesn't have a role. Amy, it's going to be Jerry. We need Cabanella. Um, Mrs. Galt. Sandy Alicia. Mrs. Galt. Mr. Galt. Ed. What? Edward Walker. Edward Walker. Right between my mother and father. I might skip Jerry's older brother. Sorry, Joe, because you'll be somebody else. I couldn't increase my role. <laughs> Officer Black. Officer Henderson. Wait, let me just see who doesn't have a role yet. I don't have a role. I don't have a role. Okay, good. Keep your hands up. Oh, okay, I have plenty. All right. Uh, uh, Officer Flagg. You? Stephanie? Stephanie Mello? Yes. Officer Henderson? Oh, yeah. Elaine? Can I be Judge Elaine Mitchell? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Attorney for Jerry. Um, Leslie? District Attorney. Mark. Mark Fernia is the District Attorney. Juvenile Court Probation Officer. 
Karen Petrie. There's no G-A-L on the list. <laughs> no. <laughs> Judge's clerk. <laughs> Who's my clerk? Who doesn't have a role yet? Maria? Yeah. Sure. Karen Petrie. Sure. 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 I guess I'll give Mrs. Cook. Apple Bob, you're Mrs. Cook. What's that? <laughs> Wait, Ahmed doesn't have a role yet either. Hold on a second. Ahmed and Karen Applebaum. <laughs> Ahmed wants to be Mrs. Cook? Yeah. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> Karen, we got to give you something. Hold on. I'm sorry. Give me the jury. You skipped the older brother. I skipped the older brother because I didn't think he was going to do much in these other hearings, but I'm going to put you in. All right. Jerry's brother. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. So, that, any questions? Am I right? Oh, I still have time. I was worried that I wouldn't have enough time to go through this. So, um, obviously, learning a little bit of evidence in this in this course as well. And I know not all of you have had case prep and things like that, but you know, we'll, we'll get through it. Uh, one of the things about the juvenile court is while we follow the rules of evidence, it's also much more informal than other courts. Um, and you'll see that, uh, you know, you see that difference in the pre-Jerry Gall days, but also in the post-Jerry Gall days, uh, frequently um, uh, things might be a little bit different based on the nature of child proceedings. So, you, you know, this is your first introduction to it, to it next week. Do the best you can, read the Jerry Gall case, be, be familiar. You know, you want to be familiar with what the case stands for so that you understand the reasons why um, the first hearing is conducted the way it is as opposed to the, the piece of the trial that we're ultimately going to do. And it all boils down to you know, the Supreme Court um, coming down with certain rights that are um, similar to adult rights that children should have because of the loss of liberty that they possibly face and, and the um, procedural due process rights that they have. Whereas with the parental rights that we just looked at, uh, in terms of substantive due process with the court balanced, you know, a statute, for example, um, versus parental rights to bring their, bring up their child the way they please. With procedural due process, the test is a little bit different. Even though we're still talking about life, liberty, or property, um, for a court to decide, first of all, they have to ask two, two basic questions. Um, is process even due? You know, so you have to look at the nature of the right there. Does it fall into life, liberty, or property? Um, but even more important, what process is, is due? Um, we might, uh, we'll be discussing in this class about the differences between, you know, Jerry Galt, for example, faced with delinquency proceeding where he could be, you know, kept somewhere uh, against his liberty versus like a school child's right to go to school. Still in the nature of life, liberty, property, but very, very different. So in terms of what processes do, the child faced with the delinquency proceedings has much more process than do than a school-age child will. So we'll be looking at that in the next several months. So I'll see you guys all on Tuesday. I will be, I'm gonna put your names in this, um, um, in the class exercise. And I'm going to email it to everybody so you know who the players are as well as the, so the online people know as well. Okay? Mm -hmm. And we're doing this Tuesday, no class a week from today to Thursday.